mic on? No? Okay. So I'm going to be talking about uh, Windows Azure today. Um, I'll first start off talking about, uh, give you a high level view of what it is, it's data abstractions. And I'm going to spend a majority of the talk focusing on the architecture and how it works. Then I'll conclude with some discussion about some design decisions we made as well as some lessons learned. So Windows Azure Storage um, provides a storage as a service, as a cloud service, where customers can actually store data uh, in six locations around the world. Anybody can sign up and use the service. And so you have two locations in the US, two in, the, in Europe, and two in Asia. And customers are using this so they can get anywhere at any time access to their data. And right now, based upon our existing, existing customer demand, we'll be at over 200 petabytes of raw data um, by December this year. Now, the data abstractions we provide for the customers with the service are shown here. We provide blobs, tables, queues, and drives. So somebody programming to Windows Azure can use these storage data abstractions in the cloud to program their applications. So you can think of blobs as your file system in the cloud. Tables provide massively scalable, scalable structured storage. Queues provide reliable delivery of messages. And the drives allow hosted VMs to mount a network attached durable drive to use their NTFS APIs. Okay? There's lots of details online about how these abstractions um, work and what they are. In this talk, I'm going to mainly focus on the internal architecture, which actually implements these data abstractions. So I first want to talk about the architecture at a high level. So I want to talk about design goals, and then what does it look like at a high level before diving into the details. So the design goals here are pretty much what you'd um, expect from any scalable storage system. You need availability, durability, scalability. Well, from talking to our customers, um, they also really wanted strong consistency for their data objects. And so we needed to find a way to provide availability with consistency, even in the face of um, network partitioning that would happen in practice. Um, for durability, uh, we focus on keeping the customer's data durable in two data centers. Um, so we make the data durable in one data center, and then we asynchronously geo-replicate it to another data center. So if there's a major data center disaster, we still have two copies of the data. And then for scalability, as you already see, we're over um, you know, a couple hundred um, petabytes already, and we need to have an architecture that scales to exabytes and beyond. We also have to have a global namespace for accessing all this storage around the world. Um, and a way to basically automatically load balance that. And so as we go through the architecture, I'll talk about the design um, goals and how they're addressed um, in the various parts of the talk. Now, to talk about the architecture, I want to start off talking about what's called a storage stamp. Um, you can think of a stamp as a, a service that's running. It's basically a storage service um, that consists of 10 to 20 racks of storage. Okay. Um, each storage stamp has these three layers shown here, a front end layer, partition, and stream layer. Then a customer using the service, they'll have an account. And they'll use a URL, um, typically shown up here, like account, account.blobcorewindows.net, for accessing, for example, their blobs in, that are stored in the service. This will direct them to a stamp. All their reads and writes go there um, to access that data. And then um, we also, as I mentioned, geo-replicate that data to another data center. Now, this stamp, you know, these 10 to 20 racks of storage represent between 2 to 30 petabytes of raw storage. To create more storage in a given data center or in other locations, we just stamp these out. We just create these stamps, and that's why we call them stamps, um, create additional ones in the same data center to create more capacity, create additional ones in other data centers to expand out to those data centers, those locations. Then we have what's called a location service that's also geo-redundant, that actually manages these stamps. It's in charge of basically doing the account allocations for the customer across these stamps, the account load balancing, as well as setting up geo-replication for accounts across the different stamps in the different data centers. And it's also responsible for the geo-failover if we need to do that. Now, now I want to talk about um, more detail and what goes on within a storage stamp. So we'll start with the stream layer. So the stream layer within a storage stamp, and th remember this is your, your 10 to 20 racks of uh, storage service, it's responsible for um, storing all the data persistently there that actually comes into that stamp. Okay? It's an append-only distributed file system, and um, it takes all the data that's from the partition layer 
and replicates it on three times across different fault domains and upgrade domains. And then based upon those nodes that you can select from, it randomly chooses those to have a fast mean time recovery. Now, when you actually store your data, you also store a checksum with each data item. And then the checksum is validated every single time we actually read the data block, as well as we scrub the data every few days to look for any bit rot. Then, of course, if you lose a storage node, a disk, or a rack, or a checksum a mismatch, we take one of the healthy replicas, we replicate the data to get the data back up to a, num a number of healthy replicas for the system. Now, then at a high level, the partition layer, this is the layer that actually understands what an object is. The stream layer only deals with these blocks and these files and extents. Um, the partition layer understands what a blob is, queue is, entity messages, and it's responsible for providing the strong consistency as well as optimistic concurrency operations for those objects. And then those objects are stored into the stream layer where the stream layer is responsible for making them durable. Okay? Um, as I mentioned, the stream layer also is a layer that actually provides the geo-replication. Okay? So when you actually store an object into a given stamp, it's made persistent in the stream layer, then the, the request is acknowledged back to the client, then asynchronously, the partition layer sends the transaction logs to the other stamp where they're replayed and then made persistent in that stream layer. Then the other big thing that the partition layer is in charge of doing is providing this massively scalable index for hundreds of billions of objects that might be stored within the stamp. And the front end layer is just a traditional um, stateless front end layer. It authenticates all the requests that come in and it's responsible for routing those requests that come in to the corresponding partition server. So for example, if you have an incoming write request, um, the partition server that's serving that part of the index will get routed that request for that object. And this, it's this partition server. That server will then store it into the extent layer, the stream layer, and then it'll be replicated, and then success is returned back. Okay. So what I want to do here was give you a high level view of how the system sort of glues, is glued together. Now I want to dive into more details about the partition layer and the stream layer. So for the partition layer, as I mentioned, one of its challenges is that Within this storage stamp of tw two to 30 petabytes, there could potentially be hundreds of billions of objects across queue messages, table entities, and blobs and across our servers. So let's just go through an example of that. So here we have um, a stamp on the right with just a, showing a few partition servers and a partition master. And the blob index is, is basically, this is the index of all the blobs that are stored within this stamp. Um, and the index is by account name, container name, and uh, blob name, okay? Now, the partition servers, as well as the partition master, are constantly monitoring the traffic patterns to this index. And let's base, assume, based upon this example, that it decides to split this index into these three parts. And the partition master is responsible for assigning these, what we call range partitions, to the different partition servers and load balancing them out. It's also responsible for deciding when to split a range partition into smaller range partitions because of how much load is going to a given index, part of the index, okay? And the partition map master keeps track of a partition map, which keeps track of the assignment of each of these range partitions for the index and what partition server is actually serving it. And then this partition map is cached at the front end so that an incoming request, example for um, an account named uh, Andrew will go to um, partition server one, okay? Because it knows that partition servers one is serving that part of the index for the object that's being accessed. Now, a few properties about this, um, which pretty, uh, um, should be pretty obvious, is that in order for, to maintain consistency, um, a par every part of the index is, should be only served by one server, and um, every part of the index should be served by a given server for availability, okay? Now, in terms of implementing this, remember that how I said that the stream layer is actually an append-only system. So this is actually, this index is actually implemented as a log structure merge tree. Um, this is similar to um, what was described by Bigtable in terms of you know, what they use for their underlying uh, structures too. Um, each range partition actually contains four streams in the stream layer to keep its data persistent. Shown here are two of the streams, a commit log stream and metadata log stream. And the commit log stream is used for 
um, making persistent all the incoming requests. So it's basically a transaction log. So when a write comes in, you basically commit it to the commit log, and then you update the data value in memory, so you have an in-memory value of the, the recent updates in case there's a read. Okay? Every once in a while, this memory table is actually checkpointed into what we call a row data stream. Okay? And then for reads that come in, reads would first search the memory table, the memory cache, and then if it's not found there, it would go through the checkpoints from the newest to the oldest looking for the data. Very similar to how um, Bigtable works in that respect, as well as uh, what's published for about the uh, log structure and merge tree. Now, one difference here is that we also break out the data bits for blobs into a separate stream. This is because you know, we have a lot of data bits that aren't going to be searchable via this index, and we want to keep those data bits, the blob bits, separate from the index that's in the row data stream. Okay. Now, as we go in to talk about the stream layer, I want you to keep in mind these two types of streams. We have the um, log streams, which are used for committing writes immediately and updates immediately, um, and then the data streams, which all the reads go to um, for accessing the data if it's not found in memory. Okay? And then the partition logs are, I mean, the commit logs are used if you have a partition reload. So if the partition crashes or you need to load balance a partition, you would replay the commit log to rebuild the memory state, which is later put into a checkpoint. Okay, so remember those two types of streams. And so the, for the stream layer, um, the stream layer is an append-only file system, and it has a directory namespace just like a normal file system would have. And you can do normal operations such as um, create a stream, open a stream, and you can think of these streams as these massive, um, potential, potentially massive files. One interesting property is that you can actually concatenate these streams together um, really efficiently. And one restriction is that you can only append to the streams. You can't do random writes, but you can do random reads from anywhere. Okay. So for the data concepts for streams, there's three types of data, con data constructs, blocks, extents, and the streams themselves. A block is the unit of append for a stream. Okay? Each time you append to a stream, you're actually appending what we call blocks. Every block has a checksum, and the blocks can be size of a couple kilobytes to a few megabytes. These blocks are actually stored into what we call extents. And extents are the unit of replication for the storage system. So the extents, when you write them, are replicated three times. And so extents is a sequence of blocks, and when an extent becomes full, um, we seal it. And from that point in time, the extent cannot be modified. It's immutable. And what you do for the stream is you just create a new extent and start appending blocks to that. Okay? And then the stream is basically a list of pointers to these extents. So we, here we have a stream called foo myfile.data. And it's just a list of pointers to these extents for the stream. Now, a couple of properties here for the extents and the, the blocks. Um, the extents can be um, different sizes in the stream, as well as the blocks can be different sizes within an extent. Now, to keep on writing to this stream, we just create new extents and keep on petting. And we try to keep this extent size to around a gigabyte or so in size. So we just keep on creating new extents. Once they get to around that size, we seal them and then go on. Okay. So I want to go through um, what it looks like now to actually create a, an extent. And the stream layer um, has these extent nodes. Um, we call them ENs. And these are the nodes with the disks that where actually the data is stored. It also has a stream master, which is a Paxos um, system that actually manages these ENs and um, the metadata for streams and extents. Now, when you want to create an extent, the partition layer will say, OK, give me a stream where I want to keep on appending to this um, stream and I need an extent to append to. What the master system does is say, OK, I look at my available extents, ex Ian nodes, and I go to assign to three of them in different fault domains and upgrade domains um, three replicas for this extent. And it's shown here in the bottom, it's assigned um, Ian 1 to be the primary, Ian 2 to be one of the secondaries, and Ian 3 to be one of the other secondaries. OK? Um, now, a few things to note here is that um, for the primary, that's where all the writes will go to from the partition layer. So all the writes always go to the primary. Now, when an extent becomes seal, sealed, 
it, there's the notion of a primary goes away because the extent is immutable. One other thing to note here is that we don't have any leasing system or management system in uh, the stream layer to determine which of the Ian nodes is the primary. The, the primary is always fixed. When you say create this extent, three ENs are assigned the replicas for the extents, and one of them is a primary and will always be the primary until that extent is sealed. So there's no leasing mechanism to figure out, okay, which one of these should be the primary. So this information is returned back to the partition layer, and then it can continue to use that extent in stream and start writing to it. So for replication, it was right to the primary, do the append, and this is daisy chained along to the secondaries, and then the result is, once it's back to the primary, is act knowledge back to the client. And for the system, we make sure that we actually replicate persistently to all three replicas, the append, before acknowledging success back to the client, the partition layer. Okay. Now, one of the properties that we want from our replicas is we want them to be bitwise identical. And the reason for that is basically how the partition layer uses them. We actually want to maintain pointers from our index into um, extent plus offsets in a replica to create a pointer to the blob data bits. Well, in order for that to work, that means that all three replicas need to be bitwise identical. Or we have to do some other magic on top of that. Um, we also want to be able to read from any of the replicas. Okay, so what, one of the properties is to have, up to this commit length, have the replicas bitwise identical. So the way this works is that um, the appends for an extent come into the primary. The primary orders all the appends that come in and assigns an offset to them. That offset is then um, sent through the, to the different secondaries, to the two secondaries, and then the data is made persistent there, and then success is returned back. Now the primary, what it does is it ensures that it only acts back success um, for an offset if it's hit all three disks and all prior offsets have returned success back. And then it finally it can return success back from this offset and then this is known as the committed length for this extent. Okay? Um, and at that, at that point we're guaranteed up to that committed length for the extent that all three replicas are bitwise identical. Okay, now um, two th interesting things to talk about is what do we do with write failures at the stream layer here? Um, one thing is how do we actually deal with duplicate records? So you can actually have an, um, a write that actually goes to the stream layer and it actually goes to all three replicas but for some reason it never makes it back to the partition layer. So what it's gonna do is it's going to um, retry and what this will cause is a duplicate records in the stream or in the extent or the stream. Um, we deal with that using standard techniques, such as using sequence numbers. Um, there's details about that in the paper. I don't have time to go back to those in this talk, but there's details in the paper. The more interesting case is what happens when you actually try to append and you have an unreachable extent node. So you want to do an append to this extent, but one of the nodes is not reachable. Well, what this system does is we have an example, continuing with our example here, let's assume we're trying to do an append to extent four, but for some reason, one of the replicas is not available. So we'll try to do the append, and it'll fail, because we have to have the data persistent on all three replicas to uh, order to commit that append as success back to the partition layer. So this will fail, and what the system does is it will seal this extent. Okay? Now, it doesn't matter if that last append occurred or not, because if it does, did occur, then that's just a duplicate record which we'll deal with with our ways for dealing with duplicates. If it didn't occur, then that's correct, semantics too, because we never acknowledge this back, this append back to the uh, partition layer, okay? So when this failure occurs, all the stream layer does is actually create another extent and then just keeps on appending. So the way it deals with availability in the face of failures and network partitioning is that it just creates another extent and just keeps on appending. So let's go through a quick example of how this works, okay? So when you append, let's assume that we actually have a failure here where the append made it to the primary and the secondary A, but never made it to secondary B. So in order to seal the extent, what the stream master does is it will say, um, it will ask the, the three replicas, what's your current length? And two of them will respond back, well, 
my length's 120, just picking a number random. And so it'll say, okay, I'm gonna seal this extent at 120. And at a later point in time, and it'll just create a new extent and keep on appending for that stream. At a later point in time, this EN become, can become available and it'll sync up with the master and then it will determine, well, I'm out of sync and it'll copy the data from an available replica, replica to keep it, get it back up to um, uh, the full sealed length. Another example here is we're doing an append. The append fails, um, but made it to the disk on the secondary, but not to secondary B. The failure will go back to the partition layer. It'll tell the Paxos system to, okay, seal that extent and give me a new one to keep appending. Um, it will say, give me your current lengths to all three replicas. It'll hear back, hear back from two, two of them, and it will choose the minimal length one. And this is the correct length to choose because this represents um, all the data that's been successfully acknowledged back to the partition layer. Okay? So whereas the red part here is just will end up being duplicate records. So one thing I want to talk about here real quickly, and again, it will sync with the stream master to, if it comes back, to get its uh, data back in sync, is what happens if we have um, network partitioning um, for the data streams and the partition and the log streams we talked about? So let's assume we have an arbitrary network partitioning here where the um, partition server can talk to all, everything here, but the stream master and the EN cannot talk to each other for some reason. Okay, and we basically have this sealed situation here. Well, for data streams, everything is okay. The partition layer can actually read from any of the replicas because when you read from the data streams, you're only reading data that has been successfully act back from all three replicas, and that represents the blue part. So for data streams, everything is just fine. The partition server, even with this network partitioning, and even though these ENs are out of sync for this replica, can read from any of the ENs. The more interesting case is for log streams. Assume we have the same network partitioning here. And when we actually load a partition, we actually do one thing for the partition. The partition server does a specific operation to the stream master. It says, tell me what commit length I can read up to and tell me what ENs I can read from. Because it wants a co consistent view of the replicas every single time it does a load of the, the partition for the log streams. And so it'll, the stream master will then say, okay, what's your commit length for everybody? It will understand that it cannot talk to the secondary B, and so it will say, I need to seal this extent, and then it will return to this partition server saying, okay, use this commit length and only use EN1 and EN2. Okay? So I want to tie this back to the cap theorem real quickly. Um, and what we've done with our system is we try to use these two layers to provide consistency and availability and the face of partition tolerance for a specific set of failures in network partitioning. We're not claiming that this solves every theoretical possible case, but the ones that we've actually seen in practice. Where the stream layer is responsible for providing um, the availability in case of a write failure. If there's a write failure, you just create a new extent and keep on appending. It also has a part in consistency in that it makes sure that all the replicas are bitwise identical up to the commit length then the partition layer is really focused on providing consistency for the data objects, um, where it basically makes sure that um, the way it uses the partition, the stream layer, it's co-designed so that it can maintain a consistent view when replaying the log records, as well as accessing the data objects. And this is designed to tolerate um, failures in network partitioning that we typically see within a storage SAM, such as uh, node failures, rack level failures, and partitioning. So I want to conclude really quickly talking about some design choices. I know I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'll just go through these real quick. Um, we've designed our system for, um, to represent multiple data abstractions um, it, from a single stored stack. So you can actually access blobs, tables, queues, and drives, and the blobs consume the majority of the storage. Tables tend to use more of the IOs, and queues provide um, their data abstractions mainly served from memory, while as drives can be a mixture depending upon how the drives use. And the benefit for this we found is that um, you know, improvements in the lower layer for the incremental cost of doing this um, help it, you know, provide improvements for all the data abstractions. So if you make an improvement in the stream layer, you provide this geo-replication functionality, we get it for all of our data abstractions. But it does come at a cost in that we haven't optimized the storage stack for any one specific type of storage. 
with an append-only system that we have, um, this has greatly simplified our replication um, protocol. Um, it's allowed us to um, add snapshots really quickly um, and easily to the system. It's great to have all the appends there in case we have to diagnose something or repair a partition. And it's really made it easy to implement erasure coding. Um, the trade-off there is additional IOs from garbage collection. And then one thing we've um, set out from the start is trying to have separate, separate out our compute and storage for the scalability of Windows Azure as a service. This really allows us to scale out and isolate these separately. Now this comes at the cost in that you have additional network and bandwidth between your compute VMs and your storage, but what we want to get to is to have bisectional bandwidth between the two of those. And the networking technology is finally, finally getting to the point where we can start to uh, um, realize that. And then to conclude with some lessons learned, um, we've spent a lot of time focusing on um, building a language for allowing us to automatically load balance our index. We found that when we deployed our, our index with some specific hard-coded rules initially, people would throw access patterns at us that we could not predict. So we built a language that allowed us to um, dynamically tweak and, mo and change the rules for these types of metrics. Another interesting lesson we have is that um, because we actually write our data um, to three replicas and only return success, success back based upon that, um, the append latencies um, variance was too high for what we wanted. Um, the uh, big table paper, those folks pointed this out, and they talked about in their paper appending to two separate streams and then taking the first one to return. Well, when we were appending, appending large blobs, we actually wanted to avoid, you know, appending to more streams and using more data bandwidth that we didn't need to have to. So we end up using what we call journaling, or it's called uh, journaling in some parts of literature, where um, for each extent node, instead of actually writing immediately to the disk that contains the replica, we actually have a, a dedicated spindle, or SSD, where the writes are all put into there immediately. And then we return success back from there. Then in the background, we trickle those um, appends that actually occurred to the um, journal into the data drive where the data belongs. And finally, a few areas that we spent a lot of time in is having efficient upgrade support. I think I'm out of time to talk about that. And uh, pressure point testing is one thing that maybe it's obvious for a lot of services out there, but it's the type of testing that we've done that to really help identify all these different interactions that can occur. What it does is um, we try to identify every single little, single point in the system that can actually perform an interesting inter um, action, like seal and extend, fail a node, um, load balance a partition index from here, split a partition, checkpoint a memory table, you name it. Um, there's lots of these different um, pressure points. And what we do is we just um, throw, you can actually program these and actually do a, a cert certain set of these in a specific order to try to reproduce something. But what we found to be very productive is basically just throw these into a tenant and just pound it with stress. And at the same time, just do all these random interactions at the same time. You know, um, garbage collect something, do a checkpoint, do a failure, just do whatever you can. And these found really complex inter interactions for failures where you had to do this plus this plus this plus this in a specific, you know, near time frame. And it found us, allowed us to find bugs in days or weeks that um, would have taken us forever to try to find. Okay? Um, so hopefully from this talk you have a high level view of how Azure Storage works. Um, I'll be giving a tutorial on the overall Windows Azure on Wednesdays before SOCC if you want more details. Thanks. So we have time for a lightning question. Hi, Ivan Bishastek, University of Washington. You didn't talk about what happens during primary failures. How do you handle those in your system? Since you said that the role of the primary cannot be reassigned. Yeah, so um, there's lots of additional cases to, to talk about there. But when a primary fails, um, the, the stream layer, the, the um, partition layer has a client will, which will realize that really quickly and it'll tell the master just create me a new extent and keep on appending. And what happens if it's partitioned and then comes back online? Doesn't the partitioning layer continue to communicate with it? Um, it, the same situation handled as I showed in the other node partitioning examples, where it'll come back online, but um, it won't allow um, taking any appends until it talks to the master. I see. Thank you. Good, good, good. Right, let's thank Brad.